Well, hello, everybody. Welcome to Pets of Politics, Mr. Watson. I am your host, Christian Watson. And today we have a very special guest, someone who has been, and he's, I'm, he's going to grimace at this, but I'll say it anyway, incredibly influential in my own career, has been an, indispens- <laughs> has been an indispensable asset to me in my journey doing content creation, doing YouTube, and so on and so forth. Mr. Stephen Kent, he here is the author of a great book that I encourage all of you to go get called how the Force Can Fix the World. Lessons from a gal- lessons on life, liberty, and happiness from the galaxy far, far away. It is a great book, if, especially if you are a Star Wars fan like me. Even if you're not, I think the book is written generally enough that most people can appreciate it because the lessons in the book are ultimately lessons that many of us have probably heard in our own lives, expressed by people close to us or expressed in general that are just put into a new context. Uh, is, as the book says, a universal language, a sort of common culture that binds us together, even if our own activities in life separate us apart. So Stephen, how are you doing? It was a very long introduction, I know, but how are you doing? And thank you for being on with me. I appreciate it. Mr. Watson, I'm doing all right. The force is strong and I'm uh-huh. very happy to be joining your show today. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, I'm going to ask the mundane question before we get into the more interesting stuff. What what pushed you to write the book? Because I get the sense that, I think I know what pushed you, but I get the sense that this book was written and inspired by things that were happening actively as you were writing it. And I draw a conclusion from the part of the book where you said you were, you used Joe Biden's speech, inauguration speech. And you said, I am writing this at the time as inauguration speech. I'm thinking mm-hmm. to myself, yeah, so he's literally latching on to things as they happen and then using them to make broader parlays into Star Wars cultural teaching. How, how will that go for you? Yeah, well, I mean, the reason that I, I wrote this book is because I am that guy who drops Star Wars references and Star Wars quotes into almost every casual conversation. And it's not because um, it's not because I, I sit around and watch these movies necessarily all the time. It's not because I'm trying to be the biggest nerd in the room. It's just because Star Wars ingrained itself in me at a very early age and even more um, in adulthood as a great textbook franchise for actually how to be a good person, how to live. It's a philosophical tale full of, uh, of great virtues ranging from humility to redemption to free will and balance. Like Star Wars is the thing that I always go back to for, for advice and wisdom uh, when the Bible isn't quite doing it for me. Uh, and the reason that I wrote it, I, I guess like I was listening the other day, just just yesterday to Douglas Murray's interview on Joe Rogan. He was his guest this week and he was talking and I'm going to botch the reference a little bit, but he was just talking about how much of a relief it is to him when he sees a movie and he's able to talk about it with somebody like in his in his private life and like they know what he's talking about. And he was talking about how we generally have a lack of cultural commons today where we share things and are drawing from the same references, the same book when we talk to one another about the way that we see the world. And it's really special that we have something like Star Wars in our cultural language to say, oh, my friend, he's gone over to the dark side. Oh, man. (laughs) Like when, when you say that, you know, it's, it's, it's so common. It's so offhand and and you hear it all the time. Oh, he's been tempted by the dark side. People know what you're talking about. And that's actually really important for any shared culture to have. We have to have shared stories uh, in addition to shared values uh, and shared, you know, civic institutions. We have to have shared stories that we all know together, not only our origin stories and our history, but myths and tales and virtue stories that we all are able to talk to our children about. So that's why I wrote this book, because Star Wars is that and has been that in the commons since uh, 1977. And I hope it continues to be for years to come. Me too. And I'm sure you'll remember, we're going to do some inside, inside baseball, but I'll explain later exactly where I'm going with this. I'm sure you remember many years ago when Disney, when Lucas 
announced that he was going to sell Lucasfilm and all of its assets to Disney. And mm-hmm. you saw the, the the fan base just uproar and in, in, in being in chaos and anger. And how can he do this to us? He doesn't make movies for such a long period. He does this to us. Disney's going to Disney fight. It's going to have Mickey Mouse everywhere. It's going to be kid friendly. Now, uh-huh. I don't think the past three movies were that. There is plenty of critiques that can be given to them, but they were not Mickey Mouseified, so to speak. They were not childlike. In fact, they were actually quite dark. <laughs> quite a few. Of right. Them I mean, dark. the the criticism, <laughs> the criticism initially was that it was going to be Mickey Mouseified, and then yes. it immediately swung over to SJW. Yes. Uh, ideological capture of the institution, and we've seen some of that happen with like yeah. the, like the Mandalorian, um, or at least with Gina mm-hmm. Carano. Gina, not necessarily Mandalorian itself, but like Gina Carano and the the fight around that particularly. A little bit. I mean, I yeah. I kind of segment that off into a, a different, a little bit of a different cultural phenomenon, which is that we know that entertainment uh, institutions are captured by uh, by typically left activists and progressives, yeah. um, and I, I do separate a little bit their hiring and firing and cancel culture practices uh, within the, the halls of their businesses with injecting uh, far left ideas um, into the actual canon and the text of Star Wars. I mean, what you just said about like the movie is actually being kind of dark, like, yeah, they're doom and gloom. They dumped all over everybody's happy ending of Return of the Jedi. Uh, you come right yes. back in with The Force Awakens with your childhood, you know, favorite couple, Han and Leia, divorced, the Mm -hmm. galaxy has been uh, uh, immediately sort of recaptured by this sort of neo-fascist fervor in the First Order, uh, and the New Republic, which we saw for three entire films, uh, the rebels fight to create, uh, immediately destroyed at the click of a button. And then, you know, there's the whole Luke thing, which is the big elephant in the room. Um, the denigration of of heroes from past generations. Um, Nothing new in the long saga of philosophy and storytelling, uh, but it is a symptom of a cynical and sort of bleak um, uh, progressive left who I think tell stories that try to undermine our sense of who we are and where we came Mm -hmm. from so they can redirect us into some sort of new, you know, utopian kind of future. Um, That's, kind of i think a a separate track to go down than like maybe the the cancel culture elements but it's it's worth talking about well speaking of the actual lore because i i reference the point when lucasfilm sold their holdings to disney for a reason because Mm -hmm. i was and i still am a very big part of the pro eu not that eu the other eu Mm -hmm. pro (laughs) not, not, not that eu pro expanded universe um faction of star wars fan base uh because disney essentially castigated all and for those of you who don't know the expanded universe of Star Wars is basically all of the things that extended from the films whether it be the comic books the games the novels mm-hmm. there's like all the films like revenge of the sith it has a novel behind it as well so people just it's the disney spontaneous movie. order era of star wars fans. yes the yeah. spontaneous <laughs> order where <laughs> Star Wars fans just got creative. Many of them were sent by Lucasfilm and they just created all these many different kinds of things. And that expanded the Star Wars universe because obviously the movies gave you a snapshot, a very confined picture of things and the fans filled in the blanks and then some with the expanded universe, which is one of the reasons why I think the expanded universe is brilliant. I mean, I have several of the Star Wars comic books. I mean, I have some Kit Fishta ones from the Clone Wars era. I have uh, Son of Dathomir, Darth, the one talking about Darth Maul, what happens to him Plag- afterwards. Plagueis novel yeah. by James Lucino is Plag- still my favorite. Yes, yeah. that, that's good too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So there's so much out there in the EU. You know, there's uh, uh, The Force Awake, uh, Force Unleashed, excuse me, uh, with uh, Starkiller and Ram Koda. There's so many characters <laughs> that I grew up with in the EU that when I heard that Disney was going to make all of the EU legends and pick and choose from the EU when it benefited them, I got upset because like many other Star Wars fans, I made the point that the EU has so much richness to it. You have the Thrawn trilogy, you have the Yuuzhan Vong, you have, I mean, you have so many things that Disney could have used to further enhance the sort of film side of Star Wars. They are using them though. And like, this is this okay, is my going. pushback. This is this is my pushback to this general idea is 
um, I grew up in the same you know era as you. I, I'm a little bit older, but you know I'm a, I'm a kid of the '90s, so I grew up on Star Wars video games, and a handful of books. I mostly read prequel EU books. Yeah. I, I wasn't really much into the adventures of Luke Han and Leia and and you know mm-hmm. Thrawn after the Empire. That wasn't my era of EU, but I loved a lot of now non-canon prequel novels, like yeah. particularly the Jedi uh, Apprentice series where. Qui-Gon, the second, the first book is like called Dark Rival. Uh, second book is called Dark Rival. And we learn about Qui-Gon's failed apprentice that came before Obi-Wan. Um, mm-hmm. This is like a sacred text to me. Um, and this is kind of going to the larger point of so much of Star Wars impact on our culture is that it is sacred to people. It is sacred texts, myths, stories, and fables that mean a lot to people. Mm-hmm. Um, but, and there's just sort of a big, but I didn't really view them as like that precious and like needing to be preserved or like given the green, the the stamp of approval by Disney. It was like Disney purchases the intellectual property and they want to actually build, you know, a cinematic universe around Star Wars. That makes sense where the timelines are orderly, where characters have full arcs across each era. Uh, there was going to have to be a little bit of like, hey, we're pushing this to the side, but we're going to pluck from it when we want to. I, I liked the designation of, you know, these stories are now called legends because Thrawn is now back in the canon in a huge way. The Yunsung Vong are also coming back. They're going to be called the Gris Kegemony and not the Yunsung Vong. Mm-hmm. Um, there, are, there are other elements of, of these stories that have been plucked right from those, those stories. Like even Ray as a character is yeah. drawn from an earlier EU story about one of Emperor Palpatine's illegitimate children. And the they're new great. In, the new yeah, too, they're so great inspirations yeah. for stories, yeah. but I think there are ways to tell them in a more orderly fashion. Um, but that doesn't really erase the fact that the, the perception of Disney taking over, you know, this, this property, it's like the Protestant reformation. I mean, it's like mm-hmm. who gets to decide uh, the relationship between uh, God and his creations. Right. Is it going to be mediated by the church or is it going to be between you and the Lord himself? Like, right. Like mm-hmm. you finding redemption in Christ. So it's the Protestant versus Catholic version of the faith. Mm-hmm. And the old school way of, of thinking was that George Lucas was the Pope. Uh, and mm-hmm. he was the guy mm-hmm. who would take your confession. Um, and <laughs> you had to, to talk to him and get his validation on what was the Star Wars story because he's the creator, right? And we hated him at some points. And I remember the hate. And I, I wasn't part of that because I was a you know 11-year-old child mm-hmm. uh, when The Phantom Menace came out. But there was hate mm-hmm. by the yep. fans for their creator, Um And then later on, there's sort of like a begrudging respect, but then a sale to Disney, uh, Mm -hmm. the mega entity, you know, it's just sort of viewed as like illegitimate by the faithful. You know, they're like, well, we didn't agree to this. You know, we Mm -hmm. we still (laughs) believe in you, George Lucas. You're the guy who gets to tell us what is canon and what is not. This has a lot to do with the broader unravelings of our society. Uh, Who gets to call the shots on what the culture is? Uh, and whether or not we get to adhere and cling to our traditions in a way that make us feel respected. Uh, This is largely what my book is about, is finding personal and moral strength in Star Wars and not in the approval of other people, right? right? Because Star Wars, at the end of the day, it gives you great lessons on how to live but if you jettison those lessons at the first sight of trouble like han did from his uh, his spice from his cargo hold mm-hmm. well then you're not treating these movies as guides on living you're just treating them as movies right you're just treating yes. them as entertainment but for so many star wars fans it's a lot deeper than that so my book is a challenge to fans to remember yes. that this lives in you these stories and these virtues and fables are inside of you no one can take them away from you. George Lucas never raped your childhood and Disney didn't either. Uh, you just have things that you need to work out with yourself uh, and with mm-hmm. the world around you. And sometimes that's peace, acceptance, and letting go of things that make you angry or upset. God knows I have to do that. I've, I've been very yeah, me too. miserable this week, like watching the Disney in Florida thing go down. Oh, yes. Because I'm, oh, yes. I'm, pers- I'm personally deeply opposed to what Disney has been doing yeah, uh, and meddling, meddling in Florida politics, 
Um, and it's really kind of broken my heart. Um, and it's left me as a conservatarian, really tortured and torn on which way yes. I need to go on this. But anyways, yes. that's a, yeah, yeah, that's a sad yeah. topic. I'll make two points, but let's go over to Disney first. Cause you made a very good point about culture that I want to emphasize and expand upon, but about Disney. No, I, I entirely agree with you. It's been painful to see Disney fall apart like this. It's been painful to see ideologues hijack or attempt to, well, they effectively have hijacked their children's program, um, you know, uh, programming, and then hijack the internal politics of the company with the Reimagine Tomorrow campaign, which is essentially the engine driving a lot of this DEI woke mm -hmm. stuff down the halls of their institutions, and then try to use that to say, you know, we're inclusive, we're respectable of people that are different. No, I mean, you're diluting the, you're, you're, you're trying to dilute the eternal value of Disney's product. Disney's product has been at least in the minds of many people, whether it be in the films they watch, like The Lion King, you know, uh, Frozen even, Frozen, which was, I, I wasn't a big fan of Frozen, but I still recognize its universal qualities, you know, Mulan, Disney was this place where you can take the fantasy world and use it to give people practicable lessons that even a child can understand that will inspire them and make them hopeful. But now, Disney has become tainted by the ways of the world, or at least I shouldn't say now because they've been tainted by the ways of the world for a very long time. We should understand that during World War II, um, Walt Disney uh, made propaganda films for the military, I believe. Um, so <laughs> people forget that. That happened. We don't really remember it because it's not in our collective consciousness of what Disney is, but Disney's always been a multifaceted institution. The problem is, the, its other facets have come full circle. They're more magnified. And people are now reacting, not just on the basis of the policies that Disney is doing, or them trying to you know, indoctrinate kids or whatever. People are reacting on the basis of what they remember from their youth, the themes of the movies they remember, and they're responding emotionally and viscerally, myself included, at the fact that they feel like their youth is being attacked. It's like, right. they're and, tied you know, if, yeah. I, if I could just kind of like weigh in on yeah. Yeah, like please. with Star Wars to kind of keep it centered, like, you know, with the, yeah. the Disney entry into Star Wars, I was worried about one thing. And I wrote about this in the Federalist a couple of years ago mm. was that, you know, for me, the, the highest peak of Star Wars moral universe is the redemption of Darth Vader. Um, I agree. Oh, yes. That is that is the North Star of Star Wars morality. Um, yes. that the, the space Nazi can be redeemed uh, by the love of the sun, uh, by having the good willed of him by someone else in a very Thomas Aquinas sense, like to have someone see good in you, even when you see nothing but a wretch in the mirror, which is what he saw every time he looked in the, in the reflection on the, uh, on the star destroyers and saw his mask, like he saw evil and he saw a failure. And he had his good willed into him by his son. It's beautiful. I live for Return of the Jedi and Darth yes, Vader too. coming back and seeing the light. I was deeply afraid and relieved that in the end of The Rise of Skywalker, an abysmal Star Wars movie, by the way, uh, my my absolute least favorite. But that's a you know that's another sidebar. So I was really afraid that Kylo Ren was going to basically get canceled. <laughs> that like. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Disney was going to close the storytelling door on redemption uh, because of ideological capture and because of the idea that so many of their creatives and their story team members and their far left fans in the entertainment media do not believe that a person who has uh, committed egregious acts of evil um, bigotry and, and racism and, you know, hate uh, that these people can come back, that they can enjoy a happy ending, possibly when someone sees good in them. Uh, so I was relieved that Ray saw good in Kylo Ren, in fact, was kind of into him uh, and that she was able to help him remember that he's been solo because we all need that. If we don't have stories like that, then we're doomed. I mean, I, I mean that in like the most literal sense. Because if Star Wars and Disney does not believe that Kylo Ren can be Ben Solo again, then they don't believe that you can ever be your ver best version yes. of yourself again after you have fallen down. And that's what the culture does to us. When yes. we see these stories play out, we go, there is hope for me. Yes. 
And I'm encouraged that it didn't really happen, but we had sort of the undressing of the Luke Skywalker character, which again, you know, kind of another uh, philosophical can of worms, but you know, it's, it's not been the worst thing in the world. At the end of the day, I think the, the Disney Star Wars films were so devoid of political messaging that it almost made them uh, kind of hollow in a way that the prequels and very political storytelling by George Lucas it, it at least aimed to say something, right, mm -hmm. about the way yes. that the creator saw the world. Yes. You know, uh, yeah, Thunder, the thunderous applause line is probably one of the most remembered lines from Revenge of the Sith. I, I, I think most remembered yeah. one of the most remembered definitely then the chancellor when uh, uh when when sassy 10 i go saying that wrong kit fisto mace windu walk into his office and, and he says uh i am the senate i mean uh you know, yeah. the, the no these, these are like the great memeable lines yeah but do you remember episode two of... attack of the clones oh i loved uh, episode i i personally um, i loved episode two i loved Aiden Christensen, most people would disagree with that statement fiercely. I have no problem with him. I a handsome young man. <laughs> but do you remember the scene of Anakin and Padme out in the field on yes. their little date uh, oh, where yes. they're talking about how they think government should work? Uh, yes. Do you remember this scene at all? It's, yes. it's so powerful yes. in a way that even the Liberty Dies and Thunderous Applause line doesn't quite get where... You know, they're yes. talking about politics. Anakin doesn't like politics. Yep. Uh, and he's complaining about the Senate. And Padme gets defensive. And she's like, oh, you know, like, how would you have the system work, Mr. Wise Guy? And Anakin says, well, you know, I'd like to have a system where the politicians get together and discuss what's in the best interest of the people, agree on the best path forward, and then do it. And then yes. Padme, Padme says, like, well, that's what we do. The problem is that we don't always agree. Aha. Well, then they should be made to. And she says, by who? You? No, no, not me. Someone wise. <laughs> yes. This is the and, problem of the philosopher king. You know, yeah, the I mean, it goes back one, to the philosopher yeah. king. There will only yeah. ever be one Marcus Aurelius uh, yes. and never again. Uh, but the general idea of this scene is that Anakin Skywalker is the median voter. Anakin yes. Skywalker is the average person. They don't like politics. They want balance. They want reasonable people to do reasonable things and cooperate with each other. But if they don't, they'd be willing to break some kneecaps. Yes. <laughs> and yes. I, I saw in the past couple of years, particularly with like January 6th, and this is not like a, a, like a throwing an elbow at the right necessarily, because God knows the left has theirs, but like I saw in that, a reminder to me that the authoritarian instinct lives within every single one of us, <laughs> you know, like democracy is this weird tacit consent exercise where like in the United States, you're born into it. And we're told that we live in a democracy and we're supposed to love it. And it's great, but it's actually really sucky. And it's really hard. Uh, th things don't happen that you want to have happen when you want them to happen. And so it's pretty natural actually to be angry and to say, you know what? I didn't agree to this. <laughs> I didn't ever agree to this. I was just born into this and you told me it's good, but it actually stinks and nothing good ever happens for my country or my community or my people. Hmm. Um, I, I love that scene way more actually, just because like Anakin's the reminder that we've all got that inside of us. God knows I do. I'm sure there are some areas, uh -huh. even in you, where you, you harbor like just the, the, the authoritarian instinct, but you have to push it down uh -huh. and say no to it. Oh. Right. Oh man. I, I don't, I, I don't know. That's a very interesting question because I think there are a lot of people who think they have that inside of them because it makes it easier for them to justify that feeling existing in the first place. But, you know, in all my studies of human nature and natural law, I think human beings are actually have a cooperative instinct with inside of them, uh, a cooperative intu intuition that creates the foundation for civilization, the need to want to exist peace peacefully. Of course, uh, yeah. I'm certain. I'm certain that Hobbes would say, "Oh no, 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 no! Everyone's a bad person. Everyone secretly wants to cheat you out of everything. They want to steal from you, lie from you. Therefore, we need government to handle that and, mm -hmm. and, and, and check those impulses." I don't agree with that idea of human nature. 
I don't. No, I mean, but I, 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 I think, don't agree with it. I think we 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 agree in general that like the human inclination is toward cooperation and peace uh, and and goodwill towards one another. Nobody wants to be violently engaged. Um, but I think this kind of goes back to like why is it that you know democracy uh, as a form of government is relatively like so young. The idea of the Republic is not actually that well tested against, you know, thousands and thousands of years of basically totalitarianism being the norm, autocracy, mm -hmm. single man rule, monarchy, mm -hmm. uh, because that is so much easier. Consensus doesn't just happen. Uh, oftentimes it has to be ground out. And in the cases of most societies, it's forced. The consensus is just forced because the alternative means deliberation and deliberation. Sometimes you don't have time. We're in a crisis. There's an emergency, right? Like you don't have time for democracy. I, I think we agree generally that human yeah. nature is good. Um, I don't but know I, sure I'm just good. <laughs> I'm not sure if it's good. I think, I, <laughs> hold on. I think human nature is, I, I, I think human nature is neutral with a few inclinations towards certain actions. I don't think human beings are inherently good or bad. Um, but I do think that's a good point. Throughout history, you have seen authoritarianism, one man rule, monarchy, dictators, inquisitions. That was the norm. Even in the religious institutions, especially there, where you had the Catholic Church, where the Pope was essentially giving bulls to all these people to go ahead and carry out his orders under the, under the sanction that they would go to heaven if they followed his exact word. That was that sort of top down mentality absolutely has been the mode for human history. Um, some would argue, I think I would agree with this argument, that, that that mode, though, is not the default. It's a aberration. It came into being because enough people were willing to forget who they really were as human beings. And people always cry out for a leader, Christian, always. Even even in this world of atomized individuals, sure, sure I mean, do, yeah. look look at our look at our sure. side of the aisle and the excitement over Elon Musk, like liberating <laughs> Twitter. Yeah. like he becomes like overnight, and because the left makes him an avatar of evil, there's sort of an element of like Elon Musk on the white horse that he's yeah. going to ride forth and solve the problem that Twitter has caused in our society and he won't by the he's way. not gonna he can't <laughs> solve the problem right, he won't he, <laughs> like like elon musk right. I, i'm really glad that he did what he did and and mm -hmm. twitter's better off for it right. but to kind of like ascribe like a heroic aspect to him like yeah. all right elon's coming for you now we're going to make memes about you know owning the libs but elon's going to do it immediately we right. gravitate towards dear leader rather than just work on ourselves exit this phony social sphere uh, of Twitter, of Facebook, because we want to be part of it. We want to be around people, um, yeah. but we don't want to actually do that. We do want a white knight to go into battle and win things for us. And Many uh, people do. that's how Many we end up do. with centuries of dictatorship. Many people want that. You're right, Stephen. And that, that bothers me, by the way, even amongst professed libertarians, you know, who are supposed to center and value the individual. They're like, oh my gosh, Elon Musk is going to save me. I can say all this crazy stuff now because Elon's uh, here. I've owned the libs. All this complete and utter gobbledygook, which does nothing to advance them as a person. And I think going back to Star Wars, in the first chapter of your book, talks about humility. Mm -hmm. First chapter talks about humility. And then there's this one part of the book that I want to read um, where you talk about the relationship between Padme Amidala uh, and Boss Nass, Roger Nass. Now, personally, I have always loved the Gungan race. I, I, I get a lot of crap for that. You said like the Gungans? Yes, I like the Gungans <laughs> very much, yes. And then again, The Phantom Menace was the first Star Wars movie I ever saw. That might have something to do with it. I had no film of reference. Uh -huh. I was like, what, six or seven? That was the first yeah. Star Wars movie I ever saw. Uh, and I, I still love it to this day. And uh, Newt Gunray is one of my favorite corporate, 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 however you say it. He's one of my favorite one of those. Corporatists. Yes, he's one of my favorite one of those. Because you have the, the entire separatist alliance, actually, and this is probably another philosophical theme, is just full of a bunch of corporatists that came together, you know, got a military, came, uh, came together under a political idealist, and used the power of the military mm -hmm. to 
advance their sort of aims through him. This is one of the reasons you said human beings want a leader. Well, even corporatists want a leader if it, if it, uh, if it benefits their personal goals, you know. Watts, Hambor, and the Trade Federation, and all of them as well. Uh, so um, but anyway, Gunray was one of my favorites of those because he always had, I don't know, something about him just being so grimy and slimy yet simple. He speaks so simply, <laughs> like no pretension about him. <laughs> He's like, go do that. You're anyway. just you're just channeling your your <laughs> secret anti-Asian hate. That's, uh, that's what you're really saying. Wow. Yeah. But anyway, um, so in this part of the book, you're funny, Steve. In this part of the book, though, you uh, it says this. This is page 23. It says uh, uh, NASA's response to Padme Amidala's request to, uh, which took a knee and asked him for alliance. NASA's response stunned the bystanders who already were already bewildered by Padme's approach to diplomacy. He said, Queen Amidala and the glorious dialect of the Gungan people, you said no Tinkin, you said you said greater than the Gungans. Misa liked this. Maybe we said be friends. Translate it for those who are not up to speed on Gunganese. That would mean you don't think you're greater than the Gungans. I like this. Maybe we can be friends. If you're not, oh, okay. And then you go into geopolitics. I won't be happy till you but, do it in Gungan speak. No, <laughs> but oh man, I, I you still not thinking you're greater than the time, Gungans. Misa like this. <laughs> next time, but. The, the, the tagline for that part of the book is the radicalism of bending a knee. And we've seen a lot of knee taking recently in the past few years. And I think there is a general principle about knee taking that is very important. The willingness, I think this is what you're touching on as well, to humble yourself before someone who you may have had a preconception about Humble yourself before them and then use that moment of humility to expand your perception about them and probably learn something new about them. I have seen the exact opposite approach taken by people like Kaepernick and others who have kneeled before the uh, kneeled when the national anthem happens because they see America in a very particular light that they don't think is very positive. So in a sense, the mm -hmm. kind of humility you seem to be talking about is a humility that challenges your preconceptions. The, he, the, the, the taking a knee that we've seen recently in our contemporary age is a kind of false humility which affirms the preconceptions of those taking the knee and doesn't push them at all. That's what I see at least. And yeah, I'm I mean, what you might think of that. Yeah. Well, I guess I, guess I hadn't thought too much about, you know, the, the kneeling or standing element yeah. of, of this. I think maybe the analogy could possibly go off the rails if I tried to tried to tried to land it. But you know, where my where my head was on this was purely Matthew 18 verses yeah, you three. Four. Yeah. Um, you know, the general lesson by Christ to his followers that to enter the kingdom of heaven, uh, you must be uh, as a child, right? Yes. Uh, it's, it's longer than that, but he's, he's telling them they're going to have to be childlike to enter the kingdom of heaven and to be a, a great follower of Christ. Um, a cynic might look at that and say that this is Christ telling his followers they need to be naive and to be dupes uh, and to just listen, you know, and, and follow him wherever he goes, like a kindergartner might tell you, uh, allow you to lead them wherever they go. Like, here's candy, hop in the van. No, we don't like that. That's bad. Um, but what he does also tell them is that they're going to have to go out into the world uh, and be as innocent and doves and shrewd as snakes. I think mm -hmm. that's the the correct yes. um, yes. correct. It's not as shrewd as wolves. Yes. But the general idea is that they have to be wary of the world. They have to be skeptical of the world, and they also have to preserve their own sense of of good and honesty. And a child is able to be humble and listen because they need help. This is why Christ said that his followers needed to be like children, because a child depends on you to feed them. They know that they need their parent. They know that they need knowledge from you. They're not going to be able to form English language words without you there to guide them. Um, there is a sense of need. Adults don't have that sense of need if they are well developed at a certain point. They are self-sufficient, right? They look to themselves for what they need. Yes. They put food on their own table. Yep. Uh, and they also, you know, self-medicate their problems and stuff like that. We take yes. care of ourselves. Oh, yes. um, 
the idea though is that you're supposed to look to Christ to actually give you direction and humble yourself. When you get a job opportunity, and I had to do this numerous times and I fail all the time, I get a new job offer. And instead of immediately looking at the job and going, all right, I know what's good for me and my family. I'm going to take it. Pray on it. <laughs> it's the hardest thing I've ever freaking done in my life is pray on an opportunity and wait for a feeling and wait for a voice, wait for a, a sign. Like that's really hard for me to do because I'm the master of my own destiny. And it is hard for me to be Luke Skywalker and put the binders on and shoot for the hole in the Death Star yep. and not be able to see and let the force do it. The but force that's shot. the idea. And what's going on with Padme and Boss Nass is humbling yourself before another, like a child with no presumptions, with no malice, and saying, I need you and you yes. need me. And I'm not, I'm not better than you. You're not better than me. Uh, yes. It's really freaking hard to do that, <laughs> no especially in, in a politically, you know, toxic environment. Especially in a world like ours, where everything is driven by status, how many followers you have, how many conflicts can you get in to grow yourself? It, 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 I agree. I agree. Um, well, look, this has been a wonderful conversation, Stephen. Um, I think this book is remarkable. I'm a pump. Sorry, we didn't get into more of it, <laughs> but let me just, uh, our conversations are very dynamic. So they went into so many different directions, but if there is, I'll leave you uh, the last question. If there's one lesson, because you have a lot of lessons, each chapter, I think in this book is a lesson. Mm -hmm. if there's one lesson in this book that ties it all together. What, what is it? The, Greek, uh, the ancient Stoic Seneca, mm -hmm. I'm sorry, Epictetus, I'm, I'm Epictetus, getting my yeah, head yeah, scrambled. Yeah, yeah. The ancient yeah. Seneca, <laughs> I can't speak. Uh -huh. Epictetus once wrote uh, that powerlessness is essentially the thing that we need to overcome in our lives to be happy. This was a guy that grew up in slavery. Uh, had his leg broken, you know, shattered by his slave master uh, when he was but a boy, and he spent the rest of his life studying philosophy and stoicism uh, to try and order his understanding of the world. Why did he have no power and have his autonomy taken away as a child, have his ability to walk upright and straight ripped away from him? And so he wrote the, the sort of famous idea for the Stoics, that your highest calling is to identify and separate matters so that you can say clearly what is in your control and what is it and what is not. Yes. So I'm going to concern myself with the things that I have direct dominion over and the things that I do not have direct dominion over. I am not going to expend emotional energy on those things. This comes from ancient times and it is the story of Star Wars. It is the story of Star Wars that Anakin Skywalker, also raised in slavery, also robbed of his autonomy as a child, and then grown up to be a young man, wounded by that experience, because he had no choice over what happened to him, had no choice over the death of his mother, it was out of his hands, and then he had a vision of his wife dying in childbirth, and he was going to lose his wife and his, and his child on the delivery table, according to his dreams. And he had no control over that either. And he freaking hated it. It drove him to madness. And he did incredibly evil things yes. to stop that from happening. He could not abide by Yoda's advice that he needed to embrace that, you know, uh, attachment is, is the shadow yes. of greed and yes. to learn to let go of all things you fear, fear to lose. To lose. Yep. Going back to Epictetus, Epictetus was robbed once. So his, his home in Rome was robbed uh, and the, the folks took a bunch of his really expensive stuff. And then what did he do? Uh, he never bought any more expensive items again. Uh, and he wrote about this and basically just said like, you know, if I don't have expensive things, then I don't have anything that I am particularly worried about having uh, my home robbed because there's nothing there. <laughs> there's nothing there of value. Anakin just couldn't live like this. This is the central idea of Star Wars that connects Anakin to Luke, and it connects Luke to Rey. 
can you let go of certain things? Or are you going to try to control, control, control? And in our own world, the instinct to control, to dominate, to build political Death Stars and aim them at our opponents instead of trying to destroy the Death Star and the power to control others altogether, right? It's like throwing the ring back in the fire of Mordor versus holding the ring and using it for yourself. You know, we are finding ourselves in this sort of death match of, of fighting for the, the controls of the Death Star of our own government. And yes. I just want people to learn to try to let go. And I am doing a bad job at that myself right now. Like I am, I'm really angry and I've, I've been fuming about this for a week and I'm trying to sort through it philosophically about Disney wading into the Florida yes. law that I think gives parents rights to protect the innocence of their children yes. until age eight. Yes. <laughs> like I think it is so sacred the yes. idea of the parental rights and education law. And I'm uh, so angry at Disney for encroaching upon that, that it makes me want to endorse the stripping away of the Reedy Creek District Authority, right? It, wants yes. me, it makes me want to endorse Ron DeSantis nuking Disney's special tax privileges. But every day I have to come back to this. Like, why did I write this book? It's because there is a Death Star. We built it. And if we want to live like Jedi, we got to work to destroy the Death Star, Boom. not try to take the controls. Boom. Brilliant. That's a brilliant way to sum it up. Wow. Yes. That's brilliant. Political Death Stars everywhere are used by everyone for their own purpose. And they get mad at each other's Death Stars, but don't really do the work, so to speak, turn inwards to fix their own. That's brilliant. It's brilliant. Stephen, thank you so much for your time. Again, the book is How the Force Can Fix the World. Um, brilliant stuff. I, I'm, 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 I'm still ruminating over what he just said. So, you know, I, I, it's just good stuff. As, as, a, as a philosophy student and as a lifelong fan of Star Wars, what you just said was perhaps one of the most profound analysis of how political faction, factionism factionalism and combat works in our contemporary age. And I really do hope we can all deconstruct and deactivate our own Death Stars before we turn them all on each other and they just end up firing at each other at the same time and everything just goes to pop. That's my hope as well, Stephen. So thank you so much for being here. Um, and hope I, I want to have you back on so we can have a long conversation about this as well. So thank you so much. Anytime. Force be with you. All right, and stay pensive, everybody. Bye-bye.